Hello and welcome to Flying High with Flutter. I'm your host, Alan Wyman. And so today I have a very, very special guest. It's John Sanmez from Bulldog Mindset. He is a uh, entrepreneur uh, with many different businesses and backgrounds. Maybe I'll just go ahead and let him introduce himself. He can kind of explain himself a lot more than I can. So John, why don't you go ahead and give a quick introduction about who you are? Yeah, thanks for having me, Alan. Yeah, so I started off as a software developer and I did that for about 15 years. I ran a company, I still have a company called Simple Programmer. That's probably what most people in the development community know me from. I wrote a couple of books on software development, um, soft skills, software developer life manual, and the complete software developer career guide. And then I got really into personal development. And so I made a bit of a shift and started a new company called Bulldog Mindset. And that's primarily what I do now is I teach men how to abandon the victim mindset, take full responsibility for their lives and adopt what I call the bulldog mindset. So, uh, you know, this whole time I've been active in real estate investment and uh, a lot of other you know, activities, everything from running around some ultra marathons last year, you know, just, just trying to improve myself and then, and help others do the same. So that's, that's kind of what my main mission is right now. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the reason I brought you on here is because um, I really enjoyed hearing about your background, right? Like how you got started programming. And uh, of course, you didn't, you never did Flutter like what we do, but you did do Android development, which is obviously related. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you got started to programming, because I think I was just listening to one of your videos. You talked about, um, what was it? You really enjoyed kind of creating things out of nothing, right? I believe that's what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I would say when I first got started, it was kind of interesting because I didn't really know that it was an option out there to, to program. I remember playing video games as a kid, and then I went to when I went to school, there was like this this class where we had Apple IIe computers, and I played around with that a little bit in, in the class and learned some basic programming language. But I didn't really think much of it. You know, it was it was kind of fun. It wasn't necessarily something that I, I want to do. But then I started playing online this these games. They were way back in the day. It's sort of like the the text version of World of Warcraft. They're called MUDs. Uh, you know, some people will be familiar with it. But I wanted to create my own. So what I did was I found out where you could download the source code for, for one of these. And I started just playing around with it and figuring out how things worked and changing some of the code until I, I essentially taught myself to basic programming, you know, with, with that. And that's where I was, I was hooked. That's where, you know, I started picking up as, as much books as I could, you know, there wasn't really internet resources and trying to learn as much as I could about programming and decide that's what I want to do. And I, and I just really liked the idea, like you're saying of creating, I feel like programming is the only thing you could do that is like true creation. Cause you're creating an entire world. You're creating an entire, you know, you're naming things. You're, you know, it's like, it's like being God almost. It's like, <laughs> like you're actually creating, you know, a world that operates within itself because none of the, all of the things that we, we do when we, we write code, they're not real. They're not real. We make them real with all the concepts, you know, we come up with, with, uh, with, they're all sort of illusions, but we're, we're making that world real because underlying it all, it's just zeros and ones. It's not, it's not anything, but we, we give it that, that life and that meaning. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, that is kind of the weirdest part. It's funny that software is worth so much more money than hardware, but hardware I think is much more, uh, complicated, I think at least, because like you said, with software, you can kind of create whatever you want, but hardware, you're really stuck at the physical level, right? Um, okay. So like when you started programming, did you already think like this is the career you want to go into or this is just something that you just want to have fun with or? Yeah. I mean, um, I, once I had started teaching myself programming at that, at that point, that's where I really decided that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a computer programmer. You know, I wanted to create games initially. That was really my, my motivation because it's sort of a double of the, you know, if, if programming is, the closest to creation that you can come then doing game programming is is to the nth degree that right because not only are you creating a world but you're creating a world within a world and you know and that's i think that's that's pretty cool and i always wanted to just kind of explore the ideas that 
you know, that I had as far as how games should work and, and go. So that really was, you know, I was really set on that from that point forward. Okay. So, I mean, but when you're developing by yourself, right? So did you actually get a formal CS degree eventually or were you, or this is just, you just self-taught and then just went straight to, to working or what, what happened from there? Yeah, I didn't really get a, a regular CS degree. So I went to school for about a year at Boise State University and that almost killed my love of programming. I remember taking a Java course and it was just, it was so painful just going through like manually doing iterations on loops and stuff like that. It was like, it was not the kind of fun stuff I wanted to do. It, you know, it just, it just didn't, didn't seem like the same thing as what I was doing when I was exploring on my own and creating, creating things. And so I, I almost quit. I almost gave up on, on programming completely. I was thinking about switching my majors. And then I got this job during the summer actually doing testing at HP and when I was doing this testing job, I was supposed to find defects in in printers and you know, from the printouts. And then I started to realize that like I could learn that the printer languages. So I learned PostScript and PCL, and then I would take the test files and I would find bugs in the test files, or that I I'd figure out figure out which commands were being misinterpreted by the printers. And then that led me to you know everyone else that was working there doing the testing, they were basically just, you know, saying, okay, this doesn't work and this doesn't look right. But I was giving detailed explanations of, you know, I, bl I believe that this, this code is being interpreted incorrectly. And so they brought me on actually to a developer team. And that was over the summer with the summer job. And then at that point I was like, well, well, I'm now I'm a programmer. <laughs> now I'm actually like doing what I was going to go to school for four years for. So I didn't go back to school. I just, just kept doing that. And my, my career, you know, kept on advancing from there. But eventually what I ended up doing was going to, I took like a correspondence school. It was this, this school called ACCIS. I'm not sure if they're around anymore, but it wasn't regionally accredited. So it was just kind of just, I don't know. I just felt like I wanted to get the, the paper, even if it wasn't an accredited paper, just to say, okay, well, I did, I didn't take any, I didn't do anything the easy way. I, I, I still went and got the degree but it was kind of interesting at the time that when I so was taking the the courses I took some C++ courses which I felt was better than Java and I had already self-taught myself C++ so I didn't even read the book I just did the homeworks every time and and I, I realized that was also the point where I realized that you know self-education is is better because I could literally i I literally just went through the entire college program for almost all the courses without having to read anything. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit on the, I remember there was an algorithms and data structures. Uh, there were some, you know, areas that I hadn't encountered there, but a lot of the degree, I was just able to just take the tests, do the assignments and pass at that point. So. Really? So you actually, you, it's kind of funny because I, I have taught people before and, I think there's people who can learn on their own. There's people who cannot, right? They they kind of need somebody there to kind of ask questions, right? But you, you, do you actually think like for most people that learning by yourself is much better than being in the classroom setting with like a strict curriculum or what do you think? I think it's, I, I, actually, I actually think a hybrid is, is the best, right? So what I actually recommend for most people now, like, and what I would do today is just, is a coding boot camp. And the reason why is because it's immersive and you're just focused on that thing and you have the guidance that you need and you're sort of learning on your own also, right? It's a combination of those those things, right? A, a college, you know, four-year degree program, it's it's great. I mean, you, you get, there's some benefits from it, but it's just stretched out and it's it's not usually challenging enough and it's not immersive enough. So you lose pieces and, and you're learning stuff that you're not ever going to use or by the time that you use it you've forgotten it you know th this is not an effective way to learn whereas a, a boot camp I, I feel like is is going to be more of exactly what you're going to need to know and then of course you're going to need to learn more stuff but now you can get paid and start working on the job where you're really going to learn and a lot of people are against boot camps they're like you know especially the old guard you know, believe me, I was one of them. They're like, oh, you can't just learn how to program in three months and then get a, a job. But, you know, the guys that I coach, when I tell them about going to boot camp, what I tell them is I'm like, look, here's what I would do. All right. Research some boot camps. Try to find one that's reputable. You know, don't worry about the price. Like, don't, you know, don't 
pick this boot camp because it's ten thousand dollars and this one's fifteen. You know, pick you know pick the best one because a couple of grand is not going to matter in the long run. So you know, don't don't pick it on price, pick it on reputation, and then go and look at the syllabus of the boot camp like three months before you sign up for the boot camp, and then take that syllabus and start learning all of those things on your own before you even start the boot camp. Right, enroll in it. Take the first three months, just and, and maybe you can't learn it all on your own. That's fine. Like just just learn as much as you can because you already know what they're going to teach you. It's on the syllabus, right? And then when you get into the boot camp, then what you need to do is you need to be the top student there, which you're going to have a head start because you already started learning the stuff that they're going to teach you. And stay late, right? Work all day, work as hard as you can, and help as many other people in the boot camp as possible, right? Because if you think about this, what's going to happen is every no boot camp can be successful if at least the top 10% of their students don't get jobs. Okay, it might not be the top 50, it might not be every student, but the top 10 is going to get jobs guaranteed, right? And those instructors that run that boot camp, they they have their buddies over at Microsoft or IBM or whatever it is and they're and they're like, "Hey, what which which guys are good?" right? And they're going to know. And if they see you there helping everyone else, and you already have a jump start on it because you started learning three months before the boot camp. You're going to be a shoe, and then you're going to get a job right away. And it, like that, that's the way I would do it, right? Because some people say, "Oh well, boot camps don't work." I I signed up, I went through, I did everything I was supposed to do, and I didn't get a job, and I still can't get a job. No one wants to hire me. That's true. People that say that that's true, but if you do what I say, there's no way it, it, you're going to be successful with it. So, yeah, I think so. I so I'm also kind of a little bit anti boot camp, but I think. The reason that I am is because like every person for an interview from a boot camp is yeah they went through it and it was like like you said they said okay I did all the courses I got my my final year project done here I am I say okay show me your code and I pick a line in the code and I say what does that mean and they say I don't know and that one is about encrypt <laughs> that one's about encrypting a password I said what's bcrypt yeah. they said I don't yeah. know I said okay what does this line mean nah, I, I don't know I, I just say uh, I sorry I can't I don't think I can bring you on like for me I'm looking for people that write the code and know what it means, right? They don't have to be an expert in the language, but at least understand what the lines of code mean. And I think that is something that, I, I don't know, maybe I'm maybe I'm too harsh. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit too harsh, but I mean, I think, what do you think about my, my thoughts? No, I think that's a perfect analysis. I mean, if someone doesn't know what the line of code does, and, and that's, and that's the problem with, you know, again, most of the people coming through boot camps are going to be like that, right? Because they're just thinking, I sign up for this thing and then I get a job. And that's not how it works. If if you're doing, I would I would doubt that someone who is doing what I'm telling them to do would come in and then not know what the line of code is, right? If they're helping and mentoring other people, if they're spending the, the time, because you got to take it seriously. And, and that's just the beginning, right? I mean, going to boot camp is just the beginning of your education. You still got like a ton of stuff you need to learn, but, you know, I think I think that's a great, great test, right, is because if you don't know why you're doing something, and this is something I tell people all the time, it's like, don't don't ask me, like, the question you need to, to ask yourself is not, not what, but why. Like, why are you doing what you're doing, right? Because guys ask me this all the time in, in bulldog mindset and dating stuff. They're like, should I give a girl flowers? Should I pay for a date? All the, I'm like, just why are you doing it? That's the question I need, I, you need to ask. Not, not what you should do, because what is dependent why what what is the reason that you're you're doing this what are you trying to accomplish what, what's your you know and it's the same thing with code it's like you you can just write code or copy and paste code and that's one thing and i think there's a lot of you know copy paste <laughs> type of of programmers but if they don't understand why then they're not going to be a good programmer so i think that's a perfect way to cut right to it and and see if they know what they're they're doing or not but now let's let's kind of go back right because this is I'm I'm starting to think about if I was somebody who went through boot camp, right? You know what I would be saying to that? Well, isn't it that like when you start programming, you start working a job, you're gonna be Google searching anyway. So why can't I just Google search my way through this interview or this kind of stuff, right? Now what do you have to say about that? I mean that's that's tricky, right? This is Yeah. I think that I think that's totally valid too. I think that's a valid response. But here's the thing about that response, which is that sure, you can Google search your way through through everything. And and most programmers do, right? You know, that's that's kind of how we live. But then when you Google search it, right? It's like, okay, it's like, let me give you an example, right? I was playing Scrabble with, with some with, with some friends and 
and they're like, oh, yeah, we can use a two-letter word dictionary. I was like, eh, okay, fine, we'll do it. All right. And then, you know, they're putting down two-letter words. I'm like, well, what does that what does that word mean? Like, I, I don't know. Do you care? <laughs> it's like, I need to look up that word so I understand what it means. It doesn't matter. It's in the two, it's, I get it's in the dictionary, but I need to know what it means because if I'm going to use it in the future, I'd rather than consulting the two-letter word dictionary every single time, I'd rather know what it means so I could use that word, you know. And so it's the same kind of thing here. It's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with looking stuff up in Google. I mean, when I was doing a lot of software development, I mean, half the time that's what I was doing. But then I need to understand what is the thing that I just looked up in Google? What does it actually mean? How does it actually work? So that's that's where where I'd say, you know, that's that's the answer. Because if you think you could just look it up and then copy and paste it, no. Do we have to look up stuff in Google all the time? Sure, yeah. But every time you look something up and then you go and say, well, why? Why is this? And you get a full understanding of it. It reduces the amount of stuff that you're going to have to look up in the future. Yeah, okay. Valid point. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, right, For because... Uh, like, the, like I said, the one reason why I want to bring it over here is because I think this is really great is that uh, so many people are actually picking up Flutter and I'm looking at like their questions and they're very, very, uh, take this as positive or negative, very noob questions, I would say, very simple questions. Like what kind of, I guess somebody would focus on themselves and kind of get like three to five key skills to really help them to excel as a beginning person. Uh, to become better, like what, what, what would you think those would be? You know, like maybe like work on their problem solving skills, work on their communication skills, work on their uh, maybe analytical skills. I see a lot of people saying that if you want to be a great developer, you should learn C, you should learn Java, you should learn uh, algorithms. Like, what do you think would be like three to five key skills? Those could be very broad, or those could be very exact. It's kind of up to you. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. I wouldn't say that. I mean. I see the benefit in in learning some of the more difficult programming languages, but it's not really necessary. I would say that the the first and biggest thing is learning how to solve problems, how to break things down, because there is no hard problems in software development, at least not in what typical software developers utilize, right? In computer science, yeah, there's some hard problems for sure. We know, we know that there's, but as far as algorithms, and and software that we write typically there is no hard problems right every single problem can be broken down to a line of code and it's always simple to write one line of code and so if you have the skill to break big problems down into smaller problems because all problems are a composition of smaller problems and, that, and that's what it is to be a programmer really the essence of programming is to take something big, break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down until it comes to a line of code. And then you write that line of code and you, you repeat the process. So breaking problems down, you know, which I'll include with solving problems, it's the same thing, you know, and it doesn't apply just to code. It's just in life, right? You look at things, you look at problems and can you break this down to the constituent problems, the sub problems, and then, you know, solve those and work your way up. So that'd be number one. Number two, I would say is, algorithms and data structures. See, I wasn't too big on this when I first started learning programming, but I started competing on this site called Top Coder. And I was just, I thought it was a good program. I was getting my butt whooped on there. I was like, how can anyone solve these problems? And then I was looking at, it gives you the ability to look at other people's solutions. And I was seeing all these, I was seeing like stacks and queues and hashes and I was like whoa I didn't learn any of this stuff because I didn't really need it and most programmers think they don't need it and and you're right you don't need it but once you know algorithms and data structures and you know all that stuff and this was back in when I was doing C++ so this was the STL the standard template library I memorized the hell out of it like I learned that inside and out read every book on that and once I knew all that stuff all these problems that I was encountering in my regular job, all of a sudden I had this solution for it that I would have never, ever come up with before. And it just became, it was like upgrading my skill set to the nth degree. I, it just became magic. I could suddenly write all this code that I, I couldn't write before. Uh, so, so learning data structures and algorithms is very, very important. And that's why, like, you know, everyone's like, well, what, you know, the 
all the fang companies the the secret to getting a job at a fang company is to grind leak code <laughs> and they're right in the sense that like why so some people are like why do all these 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 companies have these uh, you know programming problem like leak code type of of problems still you know it, it seems silly and it's because they want you to learn that skill set of data structures and algorithms because that's a very very valuable skill set to have and then the third one i would say is I, i'm going to call it poetry <laughs> which is the ability to clearly communicate in your code your intent it's the ability to name things it's the ability to what bob martin would call clean code to write clean code because that is i mean mo code is written or read more than it's written and so if you can cleanly express things and your code looks like poetry you know, it, it's a very high indicator of your skill, and it also makes it so much easier for that code to be maintained, for other people to understand that code, for you to go back and understand that code, and to uh, to write good code. So, yeah, so I think that's a very important skill as well. Sorry, lead code. Uh, maybe I, I haven't been into the Lego for some time, but what is lead code exactly? I'm sure a lot of people don't actually know this. <laughs> or beginners. It, it's... It's like this site where you can uh, work on algorithm data structure type of problems, right? You know, some of the, what are the other ones? It's like, you know, the, what's that book by Gil, um, cracking the coding interview. It's, it's those, those type of problems, the, the same stuff, like I said, that, that I had found on top coder back in the day. There's a few other sites that do those kind of you know, problems too, but it's basically training you for the kind of problems that you have when you have a, a coding problem in a, in an interview, you know, something like, you know, take this word, reverse it, you know, and, you know, or whatever, you know, those, those kind of algorithm type of problems. Yeah. I think that one's kind of quite normal, but there's sometimes where I get these weird problems where I just feel like this is such a waste of time. Like, cause, uh, at least in the business I'm in, it's always like grab data, store it, maybe manipulate it a little bit and then, you know, do this and that, but it's all like typical business type of problems. But like some of these questions were, I think some of them are a little bit ridiculous and just not even in the same ballpark as what you would be doing day in, day out. I'm a little bit against those kind of things, but I mean, you think they're quite useful to actually get into and, and learn and really play with? I think they're useful because it's like, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one of them, some of them, obviously you're never ever gonna use this, uh, but a lot of them do have practical applications but uh, but having to like learn it all like part of the reason why it, it's useful is because you have to learn all of this stuff all of the data structures that exist in and in, in all the common algorithms and ways to use those in order to be able to make sure that you can solve any of the problems so maybe there's an unuseful problem but it ensures that you get the scope of it in order to be able to be successful there but then what what happens what's really cool about this is if you have that skill set you don't even recognize the places when you don't have the skill set you don't even recognize the places you could use it but when you do then all of a sudden you're like oh i could solve this by by creating a dictionary Right. It's like, oh, shit. Like, I remember the first time that happened to me. I was like, damn, that that like, you know, I could write obviously manual code that does this. But and you might not even think it applies like in a business setting, you know, do, doing these things, uh, doing that kind of, of programming. But when you have that uh, that tool belt and you've got those tools in your in your tool chest, all of a sudden you start seeing problems differently and you start seeing these places where you could apply it and work. It, it's sort of like the same thing as having and, and i'm not a huge fan of anymore the uh, what is it called not uh, i'm losing the, the what's the the gang of four book the uh design patterns right so it's like there are these patterns and i remember when i first really read through design patterns and understood design patterns then i could see places where i could use those design patterns that i hadn't seen before not that you should you know necessarily pull out design patterns all the time but back in the day, a lot of design patterns are now baked into modern programming languages, but they weren't back in C and C++ days. And so you could you could find places where it made sense, right? I remember, you know, and it gets overused a lot today, but singleton, right? Singleton was, you didn't realize, well, shit, I could create a singleton. And that it, it made sense a lot of places until you understand what a singleton is. 
and then all of a sudden you start using it everywhere because now it's it's a good solution to a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, well, not obviously, but to me, of course, uh, dictionary or hash map, these things are definitely something I, I use all the time. Uh, I think some of the more difficult ones, I'm trying to think of something that uh, I had some weird question recently about like reading. Man, I wish I could remember. Like, there, there's sometimes they're, I feel like they're just so out there for somebody that I just feel like I just don't get it. But I, I understand what you're saying, right? Even though the problem may be really out there, but at least the tools that you use to solve that problem is what really matters the most because they may come up later. I, I, I see what your point is now. And I think that that definitely makes more sense. Now I have a little bit more open mind than before. Um, what do you think about like these logic problems where it's like, uh, let me, so I had this really, really weird problem where it was like, um, all right, you're on, you're on the, you're, you're somewhere, you're a bear, you're, you walk like eight miles east, eight miles north and eight miles west. Like, what color are you? I was like, what, what, wait, what? That It was some weird, it was about that, but basically the whole, the end of the solution was like, oh, you're a polar bear, like, and you should be white, obviously. So why do you not know that? I'm like, well, first of all, I don't even understand the question. Like, <laughs> what kind of, of question is this? Um, like, do you, like, I think Google is kind of famous for these little, little bit weird questions, but then I think they said they stopped asking those. Um, like, do you have any opinion about these weird, like, logic questions? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of it, I mean, I don't know about that particular one, if that's, you know, that, that seems a little bit odd. But if I were to even dissect that question, maybe I would look at it in terms of a couple of things. At least if I'm an interviewer giving one of those weird questions, this is what I'm looking for. For the first thing I'm looking for is your thought process and in, in what are you going through? Because you can tell a lot about a, pro a person just how they think about solving problems, especially ridiculous problems, right? You know, what, what is it, what do they say? You know, and one tip for, for uh, anyone listening as well is when you're in an interview, just talk to yourself out loud because interviewers are really, really zoning in on honing in on what is your thought process, right? That, that's very, very important. You can tell a lot about a person. So, so that's one thing I'm looking at there. The next thing I'm looking at there also is your conviction, Right, because I I don't want you to be like unsure of yourself. I want you to have some level of conviction, because especially ambiguous type of answer type of questions. If you're looking for the right answer, you know I know there's this manhole cover, like what are manhole cover? There's like estimate, like you should have some conviction in your answer. Doesn't mean you can't revise your answer, but there's there's people that just look for the right answer. They're like you know, is this right? Is this right? And they're, they're so set on finding the right answer. And then there's other people who are like, okay, well, this logically makes sense. And this is what I'm going with. And, and here's, you know, and they understand that there's not always a right answer to things. And, and the thing with programming is in many cases, there's not a right answer. As, as algorithms become more and more complex, there's, there's many more solutions to a problem uh, in, in that that multiplies exponentially. So I think that's important to, to weed out for is to look for people that if you've got a programmer that's just looking for the right answer, they're not going to be able to solve a lot of problems because they're going to spend a lot of time just in analysis paralysis wondering if they got the right thing. So, so that's kind of, you know, another part of it, I think. And then, you know, just the creativity of what what kind of ideas can you come up with? What kind of things? How do you handle uh, difficulty in, in problems that don't have solutions. Cause a lot of times in programming, you're going to find problems that do not have solutions. There is no good solution for this thing and it's, and it's frustrating. And so what are you going to do at that, at that point? So I, I think you can learn a lot from that again, maybe, you know, uh, like what color is the, a bear thing is, is not quite as useful, but there are problems that seem ridiculous at a surface level that you can gain some insights, some important insights from. Because, you know, everyone can memorize, you know, programming algorithm logic problems that are, are common ones for algorithm data structure ones. Uh, but not, you know, you, you present someone with a problem where there is no clear answer and they can't memorize some answer and, and no one knows what the real answer is because there isn't one, then you can, you can learn a little bit more about them than the stuff they just memorize and they repeat back. What do you think about like time tests that try to get you to program something like the ones that are online? Do you have an opinion about those? I I actually like those. I know a lot of people don't like, you know, I've done some videos on on, you know, what used to be whiteboard 
problems, right? But but now they do them timed with you know there's different companies like Codility or whatever that that do these these tests. And the reason why I like them, um, even though a lot of people don't like them, they're like, oh, this is irrelevant. This doesn't make sense. Is because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, like I said, with the data structures and the algorithms, I think it's it's just good to to learn that. And so, you know, it's a good filter for that skill set. If you really understand data structures and algorithms, you'll be able to fly through those problems, right? It's, it's not going to be uh, very difficult, um, you know, if you, if you really, really, truly understand it. Uh, and then the other thing about it too is that it's a good filter too for, because you know, it, like when you get one of those tests, most of the time they tell you ahead of time, oh, you're going to have a coding an online coding test, like a time test. So you know exactly what you're going to be tested on. And so if I tell you, hey, we're gonna we're gonna test to see how far you can you can do a standing broad jump, <laughs> right? And you're like, and, and you don't try and you don't train for that at all. I just learned a lot about you, right? Because if I tell you there's gonna be online coding tests and you're like, and you bomb that and you're like, well, that's stupid. That's this test has nothing to do with the job I'm going to be doing. I was like, well, OK, but I told you what I was going to test you on. And then you chose not to spend time learning that and studying that. Uh, it, it says a lot about you as a you know as a person. And then also just the, the stress environment of that. I think it's important to not just see how people perform under good circumstances, but how do you perform under bad circumstances when you're in a stressful environment, when something's on the line? Because that's how it is a lot of times in software development, right? You know, it, you, you have to be able to to handle those those situations and perform. Yeah, I, I see your point. Um, for me, I really hate those. I think the biggest part is the ticking clock, right? At the same time, like, you you know, you have to be calm, right? But if as I, as me, as I see this thing ticking down, I'm like, oh my God, I got to get this thing done. And then I'm back to what you kind of described before, where it's like I have to finish this problem. Uh, but of course, I want to do it elegantly. And then you end up taking a lot more time than you actually expected to. So I kind of had two recent run-ins with this, where the first one I actually did so well that I actually passed all of them, which they said I was the first person to ever do that out of like 20 plus people. Yeah. So I was like, wow, I felt really, I felt like I had some big balls and I was really like up there, right? And then uh, I had another one come up quite a bit later on and they were like, well, first of all, the first one, they said, okay, this is what you're going to be tested on. Like you said, they said, you're going to have to be able to make an HTTP call. I said, okay, no problem. I looked it up and and uh, they said they accepted these languages. So they already knew which languages I just picked one. And then that one I looked up and it had to do it from standard library. Right. So I couldn't pull in a, an extra library. So I, okay, I did everything I prepared. I nailed it. Like you said, I think that was great. The second one I took was actually different in terms of like it, it I chose the language that I love to use. Um, but the question was like, first of all, the question I didn't understand because it was sometimes these questions they give you, you just don't quite get exactly what they mean. So that's kind of really annoying because in the real world, right, you can ask questions like, wait a minute, what does that mean? Can you break this down? What does this, but you're just talking to a screen and you have a timer going off. You can't call anybody. You can't do anything. The second thing was I wasn't told what it was. If actually I was told the question would be so easy that anybody who programs can do it. I said, okay, fine, should be fine. But actually, this one took me some time because um, the question was actually reading in data from standard in, which honestly, you don't really do much, at least in my work and for that language. I usually pull in HTTP calls and all this kind of stuff. I don't really do standard in stuff. So that one took me quite a bit of time because, yeah, I couldn't figure out exactly how to do it and how to do it in a proper way. And so I kind of bombed that one. I actually took longer and didn't actually finish it. So... I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I kind of feel a little bit like an idiot now because of, uh, you know, I couldn't finish that second one. Right. So I'm kind of a little bit torn um, about this. I mean, what, what do you think about like that kind of situation where like, you know, you, yeah, you, you think you should be able to pass it, but you can't, right. Like it happens. Right. Yeah. And I mean, from there's a couple of things with it. What one is, I'd say that it, it's, you know, a, a big benefit of it, you know, from the developer standpoint is that it's a, it's an easy filter in the sense that like you can, you can, if you learn how to do this, you're going to exceed all of your competition, right? Just like you experienced with that one where you, you aced it. It's like, no one's ever done this before. Well, it's a way to set yourself apart when you're just doing standard interviews. Some people could bullshit it. I mean, you can to a degree, but it's like, let's say that your skill level is a hundred times better than, than the their 
the average interviewer that they have, or let's say 10 times better, right? There's no good way to demonstrate that in an interview, right? You know, it, people might get the impression of you're a lot better, but when you just ace this test that no one has ever been able to pass, then they're like, okay, well, this guy's clearly, you know, you know, it doesn't mean that you're the best developer in the world, but it's a high indicator. The same thing happens on the, on the other side too, is it's like, it's a filter, right? So, you're going to you're going to lose some really good developers with the filter like you know for for example in your case with the standard in okay so they they're going to miss you they're going to filter you out incorrectly but the biggest costly thing in software development right as as someone who hires someone or interviews is hiring a, someone who doesn't know how to code right that's the biggest costly mistake and and people slip in there that don't know how to code and so it's better to have your filter where you filter out people who could be excellent developers on your team and lose some of them than to let anyone in that doesn't know how to code and so when you create something like that you're creating this this bar again it's it's not a perfect filter but you're protecting against the the biggest downside that you have which is the risk of hiring a developer that doesn't know how to code because that can not only you know it, it's not like it's that person is zero productivity they're negative productivity because they they mess up everything for other people and they 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 bring the entire team down and they can cause some serious damage so that's that's kind of my, my view on is it's like yeah it's unfortunate it, and some of some of the things are dumb. It's like, you know, reading from the standard in, I agree. That's not, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but at least, you know, there's going to be some people that pass that obviously. And those people will obviously at least have some level of coding skills. So when I look at those tests, that's what I look at is it's a filter. It's not a perfect filter, but they're, you got to realize they're trying to filter out the, the worst or just to make sure, and they're going to lose some good people in doing that. But, you know, but if you're really, really good, what's going to happen is sometimes it's going to benefit you and you're going to be able to display your skill better than you could in a regular interview. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting. I, I think what you said is definitely, definitely true and valid. And, and it definitely gave me a different, different thought process about this. Uh, what I ended up doing was actually I went back to them and said, hey, listen, I never really use standard in. Um, this is something I do know a lot. Uh, I feel quite a bit embarrassed. And then they also know my background because I, I set my CV over where they had it already, right? So they knew it. And they're like, listen, you know what the, you know what the answer is going to be. You know what the test is going to be. Um, why don't you – we're going to resend it to you. Why don't you study up how to do it and then take it again? So it's kind of weird. It's almost like they're helping me to cross that test again, which is kind of weird. It's like almost – you know what I'm saying? Like it's almost like here, here's the answer. Why don't you you know try again and put the answer in so we can get you through the process? It's a little bit weird. but. It's kind of weird that even when I was talking to them, they're like, oh, yeah, we really don't like this first step of taking a test, but it's part of the process and you just have to do it. That was kind of the feeling oh, I, I got was like, oh, you, you got to do it. Yeah. So wow. <laughs> can't help you out. <laughs> OK, um, maybe, maybe I, I love this 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 topic we're on, but I think, you know, we should probably get back to 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 more about like what happened. Right. So you were at hp right for some time and then you changed around like you start going to freelancing right after that or kind of what happened next it was it was interesting so i was a contractor at hp and then i took another contracting job i remember i had this really big break i got this phone call this was like in the dot-com boom from a recruiter that I was working at Xerox, right? And so I had already known some progr programming or some printer languages. So it was kind of a good in for me. There wasn't very many people that knew printer languages, you know, if you, if you can think about that that specialty, uh, which is another reason why I encourage so many software developers to specialize in something because it, it's going to be valuable. So this recruiter calls me up and they hardly gave me an interview at all. It was like, just like, can you program in C++? Do you, you know... <laughs> It, it was like basic stuff, like what kind of hobbies do you have, you know, uh, you know, and uh, and they gave me the job. And it was like at this time, you know, I was 19 at the time. It was seventy five dollars an hour and it was in Santa Monica, like like in Southern California. And they had like this per diem. So like twenty two fifty an hour was tax free because it's like per diem. And so, I mean, I was at that point, 
at HP on my contract, I think I had gotten a bunch of raises and I was at maybe 20 or 25 bucks an hour, maybe 25 bucks an hour. So it was like triple my, my salary. I was like, all right, I, I packed up my stuff in my little Geo Metro and, and got down there in a week. And so that was kind of my, my big break. But I didn't really know C++. I mean, like I knew C++, but not to the degree that I should at this point. So I remember getting, and they were doing visual C++ because the, you know, and, and so I remember getting the the big, I forget what his name was, author, but this fat C++, visual C++ book and reading through the entire thing in like a few days, just trying to brush up as much as I could on that. So, yeah, so that was kind of my, my big break working that job. Okay, so uh, I think also before you start kind of a little bit talk about make it to or fake it till you make it, right? Is that still your kind of mantra back then was like, all right, I could do it. And yeah. then if to help you to actually make it you actually went through that thick book right yeah yeah I, you know I, w what it's i i sort of talk about it in a little bit different way cuz i think the fake it to you make it kind of gets a, a bad rap but it's it's almost the same thing it, it's it what i say now is like act as if you already are what you want to be right and and that i think that is is a better way of looking at it right so it's like if you want to be let's say a marathon runner, start running, you know, start doing the training that a marathon runner does, right? So it's the same thing here, similar in, you know, and the, the other aspect of it is, you know, jumping in before you're ready to swim, right? That's, and that's, that's sort of like get yourself in water that's over your head and then figure out how to swim. And that's what I did in that case was like, I was not pre prepared for that job. I was not necessarily qualified for that job, but Hey, if you're going to give me this job that I'm not qualified for, I will take it and I will become qualified for it i'll learn what i need to learn right you know some trial by fire and that i think that's a great way to to move ahead in your career but in life in general right you know, do things that scare you right that's you know do things that you're not ready for and then that will force you to rise to that level so that's what i was was doing there and that's what i did with a, a lot of my career but yeah after that i moved on at that point, you know, I stayed in that job for maybe a couple of years and it, it was good. I, I didn't maximize the opportunity that I had there. You know, I should have worked harder there f for sure. But, you know, I, it was one of my first jobs. And, but I came up to the level and then I moved to a, a startup company and did some contract work in Phoenix until 9-11 happened. And then they were in the financial industry and that, you know, they, one day they came in and they're like, uh, you know, you can, we have some good news and some bad news. And they're like, the good news is none of you are losing your jobs. You can continue to work here as long as you want. And then they're like, but the bad news is we just can't pay you. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, well. <laughs> so I stayed there and worked while I was looking for another job, you know, just like, you know, just basically just used the office to look for another job. So, you know, and then I did a lot of contracting. I ended up, I ended up doing some freelancing on the side at that point, developed it. my first independent app was a Palm Pilot app that was written in C for a, a magic the gathering life counter and i sold it on online and through through some magazines I, I had to come up with my own shareware kind of encryption code for it so that people could register it and then yeah and i did a bunch of contracts and uh, moved around from new jersey to florida and then i you know finally ended up taking a permanent job at hp and then quitting that job and then i was pretty much doing at that point, I had my own company, Simple Programmer, going really well, and 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 I was doing a lot of freelancing. A lot of uh, people were coming to me and and asking me to work. Uh, I did a lot of. I kind of specialized in test automation, um, so I'd make automation testing frameworks and and things like that, which was that was a lot of fun actually. So because it was, it it created another meta level. Is you know I always found doing automated testing to be a lot of a lot of fun a, ch a new challenging domain in programming wow, you so. kind of brushed over a lot of stuff uh, but uh what about uh i'm actually kind of curious about why did you decide to make this magic gathering as this kind of a side income where you thought you're going to make it rich or you just wanted to try something out to see how it goes or what was the kind of thought process yeah i didn't really have the entrepreneurial mindset at that point it was more about like i was playing the game i enjoyed the game i I had this Palm Pilot. I thought it was a cool piece of technology. I wanted to figure out some way to use it. And I was like, okay, well, this makes sense to make a life counter here. 
and instead of diet, it would give me a good chance to create a Palm Pilot application. It'd be something that I would I would find useful, and so I, you know, I decided to create it. And then I thought, well, I might as well, you know, sell this thing. I didn't realize like I probably could have made a lot more money from it because I didn't realize that how valuable it was at that that point in time. But you know, it was a good it was a good chance for me to learn to build something and then sell it. And also uh, a question came to my mind, like back when you were talking about, uh, what, what was that? When you took the job uh, in Santa Monica, was that kind of the start of this idea of the bulldog mindset, do you think? Because, I mean, it's it's quite a big step, right? To, to take such a leap and then, you know, really dig into this thing, kind of really make it, right? Do you think that was kind of the start of, of this idea? That's a good question. I never really thought of it that way. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really think of it as, Bulldog, because Bulldog Mindset didn't really arrive on the scene until about three years ago. I didn't really have that kind of mindset, but there must have been some part of it now that, you know, you mentioned that, and I think of that, because it was a pretty big leap, right? Just to leave, go to a new city, a big city all by myself (laughs) with not knowing anyone, just, you know, just showing up there. But I don't know, that's just kind of how I've always lived my life is, is just getting, getting in over my head. But it it still wasn't really the you know, what what I would call the bulldog mindset today because it's it's still I still had a lot of victim mindset within me at that at that point you know even though I was, I was taking those those opportunities I think some of it was luck you know to be honest at at, at that part in my career you know obviously I had to take the step and and be willing to do it but a lot of things early on I would I would attribute to luck like just getting that job was was luck because I didn't necessarily deserve that job but I capitalized on that luck that was the thing you know the same thing when I started my when I started making pluralsight courses I kind of got lucky to get in there and to be doing pluralsight courses but I capitalized on that luck by doing 50 maybe courses, we could talk a little bit know? about what is bulldog mindset victim mindset because I think most people on this channel at least don't don't have any idea what we're we're talking about yeah yeah so you know Bulldog mindset is, is the opposite of victim mindset. Victim mindset is saying that it's not my fault. Life is unfair. It's it's any it, blaming anyone but yourself for your problems in life, right? And this is a a huge common problem in society today. So many people have this victim mindset, right? It they they want to say it's not my fault, and they'll blame it on any form of ism, or they'll blame it on society or class warfare or whatever it is it doesn't matter because it all equates to the victim mindset because the the truth of the situation is even though life is unfair right life is unfair i do not disagree sometimes it's unfair for you sometimes it's unfair against you that's what i think a lot of people don't realize but even though life is unfair it doesn't matter because no one cares no one cares about you right you're on your own I mean, people will be there that they care about your welfare and, and well-being to some degree, but no one cares about your hopes and dreams. And so the bulldog mindset is to abandon this victim mindset and to say, look, regardless of whether life is unfair or not, I'm responsible for my life and is taking full accountability and responsibility for your life and saying, look, you know, where, wherever the board is, whatever position the, the board is, the pieces on the board are, I have to play it. And so I'm going to play it the best that I can. And I'm not going to waste any time complaining or whining about life being unfair or what has happened to me uh, because that's that's the victim mindset, right? That that takes away your power. Instead, I'm just going to say, okay, well, here's what I got to deal with. Here's what I got to work with. And I'm going to make the best of it. So what do you think would be like a first couple of good steps that somebody could take to transition from victim to, to bulldog mindset? Stop making excuses and stop blaming people right just stop and and stop you know i i a lot of it is rooted in deeply in stoic philosophy like reading some stoic philosophy i think would help because a lot of this is emotional mastery right is is letting go of the need for you know feeling that you need to have some kind of justice in in your life right realizing that life is unfair just acceptance acceptance is is the key because you know, if you're constantly looking at how things should be in life, you're going to have the victim mindset, right? Instead, you just have to accept reality. Okay, this is what it is. It doesn't matter how it got there. It is what it is. Now, what are you going to do about it, 
right? You take that emotion out of there and then you start looking at it and saying, okay, well, where, where do I, where do I go from here? What do I do? What do I need to do to accomplish what I want to accomplish in life? That's, that's how you, you, you get that start, but you have to eliminate all excuses from your life, valid or not, right? What I tell guys all the time that I coach is I'm like, look, your excuse is valid, but it's still irrelevant, because it doesn't change any excuse, whether excuse is valid or not, a good excuse is still an excuse. So get rid of it. It doesn't help you. I, I don't care. I, I'll sure you want the justification. You want me to tell you, pat you on the back and say, that's a good excuse. Sure, it's, it's a good excuse. That's fine. But it's still an excuse. It's just like, you know, if you're late for work or let's not say late for work, let's say late for an, an interview right? And there's only one time slot for that interview. And the reason why you're late for the interview is because someone rear-ended you on the freeway and you got into an accident and you couldn't get there in time. That's a pretty good excuse. It's still an excuse. You still miss the interview and that, and you're still not going to get the job because that was the only slot that was available. So, you know, it, it does you no good to, to have the, to hold on to that excuse. You still have to take responsibility and say, well, you know, I, I suppose I should have gotten there even earlier or, you know, I, I chose to drive or I could have, as soon as the accident happened, taken a taxi or whatever it was like there, like you can come up with, you know, but if you, if you choose the victim mindset, if you choose to use the excuse, even if it's good, then you don't learn anything. You don't grow and you don't solve your problem. But if you say there's never an excuse that, that is valid, then you have to start thinking of other ways to live your life. And, and taking responsibility it gives you power. It's to pretty interesting. So you're saying like, life. even though like something's a little bit outside of your control, like you said, that rear end example, you're saying that you should really just go back and say, maybe I should have even left three hours earlier than I should have in order to kind of escape that chance. That's, that's what the kind of thought process you have. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, cause regardless, I mean, and maybe there's not much that you could, could do about it in some cases, but it's still your responsibility. Like blaming anyone else, making the excuse or using the excuse is, is not going to be helpful, right? You can either change that or it's, and sometimes just shit happens in life. Okay. So you just got to deal with it. Like there's no, it's not personal. You know, the universe isn't, God isn't pushing his thumb down on you and like, eh, eh, take that. It's just, it's just okay. what happens. So you just move on. Yeah. I suppose sometimes you just have to just accept the whatever's given to you, right? Like that test where the standard end where we never really it's, shit happens, right? <laughs> next time, next time, study standard end, I guess. So then, in case yeah. it ever comes up again, then I'm ready to go, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, exactly. but I think yeah. another reason I'd also want to bring you on was about the Android app, right? And I think this also relates back to the to the bulldog mindset. Like, do you think that you had the bulldog mindset when you actually went in there and finished up your Android app? And uh, maybe we can kind of talk about like what, why you decided to start it and like what was the change that made you finish it, et cetera. Yeah. That, I mean, that was, that was really the start of, of what maybe what I call the bulldog mindset is, is that's when I had this distinct change in my life where I would say I became a finisher Right. Because up until that point in life, I had started a lot of projects, right? I called the closet of broken dreams. You know, you got the yellow belt in there from Taekwondo and soccer cleats and guitar that you never played and a half written book and, you know, actually not half written, like a one chapter of a book that you wrote. Right. And, you know, and that's what, what I did is I would just started all these projects, just like most people do, you know, the, the shiny, uh, you know, shiny object syndrome and, you know, give up when it's, when it's hard, but, on this project, I wanted to create this running app for Android. I wanted to create an Android app. I came up with this idea of this running this pacemaker app that would help you keep your pace when running. And it was hard. It was a challenging problem. But I decided that I was going to finish this, right? I was just going to spend an hour a day working on this until it was done. And, you know, there's a point where I really wanted to give up when I was maybe 80% done with the project and I just had the hard stuff left. I said, no way, I'm going to finish this project no matter what. And that was a huge turning point in my life because at that point, I really became a finisher, right? I started applying that to everything. I never started something that I wasn't going to finish. And that made all the difference in life because the way I look at it is it's like a bridge that's 99% complete is worthless, you cannot cross it. And in fact, it's worse than worthless because you also wasted all your time. 
And there's so many things in life that I realized I was wasting this time. I was building this 85% complete bridge, this 90% complete bridge, and all these bridges were worthless because none of these bridges could get you to the other side. And so I started from that point just making sure that if I started a bridge, I finished that bridge uh, so I could actually utilize that bridge. Uh, otherwise, I didn't start at all. I didn't waste the time. And that was that was huge, you know, that um, that really ch made a, a big change in my life and in, in my, so what, what my was kind of, So really just the Android app was really the catalyst to this idea that you had to start actually, not start, but you had to actually finish what you start. Was that really just the Android app? Just one day you just kind of woke up and you're like, I got to finish this damn thing? Or what was kind of the, like, really that was it or... Is there anything else behind it? That, yeah, I mean that was that was the first thing that and and what happened was when I actually went through and, and finished that thing, I, I realized that I started making money from that. I a lot of opportunities came from that. That's where Plural Site opportunity came from. I had speaking opportunities because of the app. I was in a magazine. It was like all of these things happened because I finished. Right. And so that reinforced that, that belief. And, you know, and then from that point, I, I, around that same time, I started a blog, the simple programmer blog, and I finished like every week I put out my three articles and I did it every single week. And, you know, I, um, everything that I was working on just, it became like that. And then my, my, all of a sudden all these things start happening in my life. I, I started having the success that I hadn't experienced. I think this is before, a, a so. great point to actually pivot to one more topic I wanted to kind of finish up on, which was, uh, um, I'm not sure how to even state this, but I'm sure, I know you're a big proponent of kind of like getting yourself out there. And one of the places you're, you that is, of course, is uh, blogging, right? Do you still recommend blogging? And is there any kind of tips you think people should do to kind of put themselves out there? Yeah, I I think that, you know, a lot of people, I mean, everyone always says, oh, blogging is dead. YouTube is dead. like podcasting. Is, everyone always says that it's too late, but it's not. It's never too late. If you're creating good content, creating good information that's useful to people, you know, people still search on Google. People still listen to podcasts. They watch YouTube videos, right? All that stuff is 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 possible. So you just have to pick some kind of platform that you that you want to use. And, you know, you can... You know, putting yourself out there, building a name, building a reputation, a brand for yourself is 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 critical, right? Because I mean, you you saw the benefits of it even just with your, you know, that test that you took, right? That programming test. Now, I don't think that they do it for everyone, but you know, with the, with the standard in, they, you know, they looked at your 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 CV and they're like, oh, you know, they probably listened to your podcast, so they probably you know googled your name, and they're like, okay, well, this guy clearly needs to get into the next step of the the interview, right? Uh, that's that's what I would guess anyway. But having a brand is is extremely valuable. You know, people will come to you and they will give you job offers instead of you going out there. When I did my consulting, I mean, people would come to me and when they come to me and then ask me how much I bill per hour, it's more because they're willing to pay more rather than you going out there and soliciting work, you know, inbound marketing. Uh, so I think it's it's extremely valuable if even just for that purpose but also you know you could build a whole business out of it i didn't know i was gonna you know build a multi-million dollar business off of my blog you know that you know I, I had no idea that that was gonna happen but you know it it did and it's still possible today so you just have to pick some medium you know today i i like youtube you know i, I feel like that's a good one because it's 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 got a little bit of a higher barrier to entry right and I feel like it's a little bit easier to get some traction and grow on there than, you know, blogging takes, you know, either, either way is going to take time. Right. The, the, and the minimum I say that people need to commit to this is five years. And I know that's, that's tough and it doesn't mean you won't be successful before five years, but you, if you're not willing to commit to something for five years, then, then you probably shouldn't do it because it may take that long to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, I know what you mean. Um, I know I, I have another YouTube channel besides this one and I think I did it for at least a year and a half until I finally got 1K subscribers. But I can see that once you get the first 1K, then it just starts kind of building up even faster. And uh, yeah, it takes a long time. But once you get through the first 1K, I think after that, yeah. life definitely gets much easier. Uh, probably similar for anything, right? Once you start getting the first X amount, then it just kind of starts snowballing. Uh, yeah, it's... Okay, so yeah, but I mean, the only thing I have against YouTube is that people like usually Google search, right? And um, I find that a lot more people get noticed from blogs rather than from 
uh, YouTube videos because of the Google search, right? I guess there's just more keywords you can find from SEO from the blog than you can from a video, right? And that's, of course, you somehow hit the right keywords within the description or something. This is what I usually seem to find. Yeah, I mean, it. yeah, it depends on what kind of content you're creating, too. If you're, if you're writing up, you know, real technical solutions to problems and Google is going to be, you know, blogging is going to be your, your best. If you're writing more soft skills type of, of stuff, then probably YouTube. Right. I think you got one more small better. thing because you did mention soft skills. We have to talk about your book, right? Soft skills, which I, I guess you're still repping, right? I mean, you have two books, right? I, I started reading sure. soft skills. I had to get back to it. Um, then you have the, the software developers career guide, I believe. Um, but I think more importantly, your soft skills, you just had a second edition out, right? So, um, do you have anything to say about that? I mean, you think, obviously I think you think it's a good yeah. idea. People should pick it up and read through it. Like, is it a beginner's person, beginner's book? Is it advanced? Is it just for all, uh, degrees or what? It's really for all, you know, wherever you are. Uh, it, it's more of a personal development book for software developers, right? That's why I call it the, the life manual because it covers everything from your career to learning how to market and brand yourself to learning to uh, finances, like how to invest in, fi in your, your financial well-being as a developer, how to spend your paycheck, not go in debt, and then fitness, and then also the the kind of spiritual aspect of of things of you know how to improve as a person how to you know grow yourself and you know get through some of the mental blocks that you have limiting beliefs that you have so it's it's really designed to to encompass sort of an entire life philosophy that's targeted at software developers specifically and i updated it with the with the second edition added some things like stoicism which wasn't in the first edition because i really wasn't aware of it when i first wrote the book and uh yeah and, and i had a chapter i believe on how to build true wealth right what it is to actually build true wealth that's you know to become financially free uh, things like that kind now of as somebody I, who's I wrote a couple books life. uh do you advise people to also write a book too because that's actually what i hear a lot from people i mean of course you not always can be rich from books but like do you think it's actually worth it for people to have a try and try to write a book? I would say that it depends on what you're doing it for. I mean, if you want to have a successful book, you need to have an audience first. That's just how publishing works today. I mean, it's, it's all, always was a good idea, but the, the odds of you writing a book and being successful with it, if you don't already have an audience, are extremely small. There's, there's so many books out there. People can publish their book for free it's it's you know it's a very low barrier to entry so but if you have an audience so that you have someone you can push the book out to and get that momentum and get ranked in amazon that will uh, you know that's that, that's the key right for my last book for the complete software developer career guide it took me six months to write the book because i wrote an hour a day for six months first thing in the morning it's like uh, 250,000 words i think 800 pages is what it, what it worked out to but it took me three months to market that book because you know, that was just as important uh, of a of a job. Had I not have I just released the book, it wouldn't have been successful. But you know, I marketed that book. I made sure that I launched that book, uh, and and got a lot of attention on it when it first came out. And it actually ended up being on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list uh, for for the week that it came out. Which I think is the only software development book that's that's ever <laughs> done that. They're probably like, what is this book? Uh, but it it paid off because that book uh, I think I've I've made close to uh, I'd say five hundred thousand dollars of profit on that book self publishing that book so far it might be it might even be more than that but you know that's that's the thing it's like don't just write a book and think that it's going to magically happen right again if you want to write a book because you just want to write a book sure go ahead but you know if you're thinking about making money from a book. Most books don't make money, especially if you use a traditional publisher. But you can. You just have to have an audience first. Yeah, that's, that's what I, I heard. So you gotta it's always like, book. don't think you're going to get rich from making a book. But it does give you credibility. And like you said, if you have an audience, then maybe you can make a buck from it, right? So it's such an investment. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're approaching yeah. like the end of our time. Uh, is there any kind of last plugs or anything you wanted to kind of give or anything you wanted to say? Uh 
just uh, Murphy, if you want to check me out, you can go to uh, bulldogmindset.com, and that's where my latest stuff is. I just take the bulldog great, quiz. Great. Well, thanks for having you on. Uh, I, I, hopefully, again, we can have you in the future. I'd love to have to talk about like you know how to build up your audience because that's super important for any developer, especially uh, with COVID. Right? You can't if you know a lot of people lost their jobs. They would love to kind of market themselves. So that'd be great to, to hear about how you kind of did that. Uh, but yeah, anyways, yeah. thanks thanks again for, for joining us. So hope to hopefully have you again sure. soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Right, Appreciate it. it.